Hey folks, today's episode is brought to you by the Comedy Jam on Comedy Central. Based on the popular live show, comedians take the stage to tell a funny story about a song that means something to them, then they live out their rock star fantasies by performing the song with a live band. Special guests include Jay Farrow, Mark Duplass, and Jesse Tyler Ferguson. Don't miss the Comedy Jam, Wednesdays at 10, 9 Central on Comedy Central or anytime on the CC app. We're also sponsored today by Cabbage. What? That can't be right. No, wait, it is. Cabbage with a K. If you need flexible small business financing, Cabbage has the answer. They've created a way for you to get approved right away, online or from your phone, for up to $100,000. Visit Cabbage.com slash WTF. When you qualify, you'll get a $100 Visa gift card. That's Cabbage with a K. K-A-B-B-A-G-E dot com slash WTF. Okay, let's do the show. <laughs> All right, let's do this. How are you, what the fuckers? What the fuck, buddies? What the fucking ears? What the fuck, Adelics? What the fuck, Nicks? What's happening? I'm Mark Marin. This is my podcast. Welcome. Thanks for hanging out. I know uh, a lot of you have been hanging out for a lot of years. Some of you are new because I can tell. By the numbers. Glad that people are finding some, uh, relief or whatever. Someone just told me that, uh, that my, uh, my podcast has become essential for them, uh, to fall asleep. I don't know, I don't always know how to take that. I, there's, there's a couple ways to take that. Either, uh, <laughs> it just puts me right to sleep, right? As soon as you start talking, whoo, my eyes glaze over. Or there's something comforting about the persistent, uh, aggravated, uh, uh, intensity that happens out of my face into your head that you find comforting. And if that's the case, I'm sorry. I, I, it can't be easy for you the rest of the day. I am recording this a few days early for a couple of reasons. Uh, one being sometimes I don't like to take all the equipment on the road. What is that? Who's calling me? What's happening? I'm literally calling myself on FaceTime. Like, it, like I, I, I don't know, I was on my, uh, my own contact information on my iPhone. I must have hit a button and now I'm getting a FaceTime call from me and I'm looking at myself talking right now on my phone and I, I don't think I should answer it. I don't want to leave a message for me. That was weird. Why did that happen? I can't trust anything anymore when it comes to technology, but that, but that is the case. The reason that I'm doing this a few days early is twofold. So I'm not, I'm not going to be up to speed, uh, on, you know, anything that's really happened over the weekend, uh, because, uh, maybe that's what the phone call is. Maybe I'm calling myself to tell me what's going to happen. Maybe that's me calling from the future just to give me a heads up. They knew that I was recording and it's maybe it's a message going like, I don't even bother. A lot of shit goes down over the weekend. It's going to sound weird on Monday when you don't address it. And here, here's the rundown. Anyways, they, all right, I'll get to it in a second. I, I want to, uh, I want to, you know, let you know. You can mark this down on your calendars. If you're in or around New York City on June 3rd, I will be at this year's book con along with my producer Brendan McDonald, where we will have the first public unveiling of our new book. Waiting for the punch, words to live by from the WTF podcast. Go to thebookcon.com for tickets. You can get a day pass for Saturday, June 3rd, if you want to see us. Jeffrey Tambor also has a panel on Saturday, so you'll get some bang for your buck. It should be fun. Very excited about the book. Uh, yeah. Oh, also today on the show, Paul Schaefer. Paul Schaefer has been sort of, uh, making the rounds a bit because he's got an album out called Paul Schaefer and the World's Most Dangerous Band. But I'll tell you, man, if you're my age, even if you're not, but probably more so if you are, 53 that is, in and around that area, the the figure or the the person that is Paul Schaefer on television is uh, somebody you've watched for decades. Uh, it's just, it, and he's always been this sort of secondary character. Obviously, the music's important, but him as a personality has you know, somewhat evolved, but maybe just gotten older. But if you were a, a kid like me, you know, in my first or probably my second year of college, 
I don't know when that show started, but I remember watching it religiously uh, every night on a on this clunky small color television set, thirteen inch or whatever. On my bed, I would move it onto my bed so I could watch Letterman at night. That's the kind of social life I had, and I was a religious uh, viewer of Letterman there at the beginning because it was so fucking great. I just the the place that guy has in my mind, in my life, in my heart is is powerful. You know, David Letterman, but uh, but watching Paul Schaefer at the beginning and evolve into this strange sideman sidekick. You know, with him with his. On, even earlier, back on SNL, when I was a, wow, I just, yeah, I mean, when I was in high school, junior high, 77, just seeing him around in those bits with those big glasses, the big Elton John glasses, and then seeing him on Letterman and developing this rapport with David that was sort of weird and stony and just a little off. I don't know if it was, I don't know if it was a weed related. I just think it's Paul. And then just, you know, seeing him everywhere, the Blues Brothers movie, and then just seeing Paul Schaefer around. He's been this guy in the corner of the screen for decades, and, he, you know, he becomes more of a person as time goes on, and you watch him get older, and you watch him that when later, the, the, the last David Letterman show over those years. But he's just been with me seemingly since I was 13, so that's like 40 years Paul has been in the corner of the screen. I was happy to have him here because he's an amazing musician. He's been involved in a lot of stuff. And he's known a lot of people. And uh, so it was exciting for me to talk to Paul. I, I remember that I was going to tell you why why, why I'm doing this today. I, I, I'm not, I didn't forget that. By the way, Austin, Texas, next week, Paramount Theater, March 31st, uh, Austin, Texas. And I'll be in Boulder on April 7th uh, at the Boulder Theater in Denver at the Paramount Theater on April 8th. And yeah, so, you know, that's happening. We're sponsored today by stamps.com. One of the sponsors our listeners use the most. Why? Because they save people time and money. What better reasons are there? Mail any letter, any package using just a computer and printer and the mail carrier picks it up. Avoid the hassle of the post office and mail everything from postcards to envelopes to packages, domestic or international. Create your stamps account in minutes online with no equipment to lease and no long-term commitments. Just quick print, mail, and you're done. And unlike the post office, stamps.com never closes. Use it at your convenience any time of the day. They'll send you a digital scale to automatically calculate the exact uh, postage you need, and it only costs fifteen ninety nine per month with no hidden charges or contracts. And right now, you can enjoy the Stamps.com service with a special offer that includes a four-week trial plus postage and a digital scale without long-term commitments. Go to Stamps.com, click on the microphone at the top of the homepage, and type in my code WTF. That's Stamps.com. Enter WTF. Stamps.com. Never go to the post office again. Pow! I just shipped my pants. Just coffee.coop. Classic plug. So the reason, the reason I'm recording this today, and uh, this has happened before, maybe it's happened to some of you. It's not a good thing. Uh, it's, 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 it's really probably, you know, outside of, uh, illness or heart attack or, or, you know, uh, maybe looking at the news and finding out the entire world's on fire is, uh, it's sort of a bad moment when, you know, when you you don't realize anymore, you, maybe you've done it once before, but you just start getting sloppy and you start setting that, uh, that, that mug of coffee a little too close to the laptop on the table and uh, you don't anticipate ever knocking it over for whatever fucking reason, but uh, it happens and there's that moment where you feel it happening, you just hear the clink of that glass tipping over and you look down and you just see liquid all on the top of your laptop, right on the keyboard, soaking into those little circuits. And that moment is like, ah, shit, what the fucking fuck? And then you scramble, you wipe it off, maybe get a hair dryer. So, yeah, that happened the other day. So I don't know how how it's going to hold up. And miraculously, you can't put your whole computer in a, in a bag of rice. If that even works. But uh, I freaked out. I wiped it up. I didn't have a hair dryer. Don't have a hair dryer. Put it outside. Baked it a little bit. Turned it over to get some of the liquid out. I did, I did this all very quickly. The thing seems to be working, but I don't trust it enough to necessarily take it on the road and do the business I need to do. 
you know, like mail the files for the podcast from the road. So this is what's going on. I am getting, I had ordered a new computer because this one's about stupid. You know, it just starts getting slow and tired and a little, uh, little senile and it's got too much on its mind. Uh, there's a lot of, uh, you know, aggravating, uh, you know, porn links sometimes that, uh, you know, they can't shake and all the baggage that comes with that and God knows what else. It's just, you know, the brain can only take so much when it's mechanical and, you know, even an organic brain has its limits. But that, uh, that happened. That happened yesterday, of course, the day before I'm, uh, I'm heading out to the, to do some gigs. So I have a, a volatile, fucked up, little wet brain laptop that I, I can't depend on. So I'm getting this done now. So that, that, that's what happened. I'm sharing that with you. Got a, I got a weird email. It's not even that weird, but I, I found it entertaining somehow. So I'll, I'll, I'll address it. Uh, subject line, am I a big jerk? Hello, Mark. You seem to be the man of introspection, so I hope you appreciate this email and do not just want to beat my ass. I discovered your show about three weeks ago, and I have since watched throwback bits from a handful of comedians. My question is, am I a big jerk? I watched young Louis C.K., young Mark Marin, and young Joe Rogan and was astonished at how much I liked the 2017 versions. I've loved everything I've seen of yours on Netflix, belong to the Louis C.K.'s mailing list, and actively look for Joe Rogan's tour dates. But watching videos of young versions of you guys made me want to fight you guys. This is a super weird email to send to anyone else in the world, but uh, WTF seems to thrive on introspection and irrational anger. So what are your thoughts? I love you, old Mark M. Sincerely, a 30-year-old who must be 50 at heart. I don't know if the anger is always irrational, but I appreciate your email. And uh, look, uh, no one wanted to kick young Mark Maron's ass more than young Mark Maron. And I don't think you're alone in uh, in wanting to kick young Mark Maron's ass. Uh, or Louis. I don't know why you would necessarily want to kick Louis' young ass. Uh, but it, maybe you have a problem. But Joe uh, Rogan, I can tell you fairly confidently, uh, I, I don't think you'd you'd want to try to kick young Joe Rogan's ass. And when he was a young comic fresh out of the kickboxing game, I don't know. Maybe, you know, maybe you gotta, maybe you have to look inward, my friend, Brad. Maybe you have to look inward. But, uh, and, and also I, I might, uh, uh, say that, uh, I was on top of that. Uh, young Mark Marin was uh, busy kicking his own ass, uh, almost 24 hours a day. Not all ingredients are created equal. Fresh, high-quality ingredients make a real difference, so it's important to know where your food comes from. Thankfully, for less than $10 a meal, Blue Apron delivers delicious, quality food, courtesy of more than 150 local farms, fisheries, and ranchers across the U.S. right to your door. Supporting a more sustainable food system and setting the highest standards for ingredients. Plus, with Blue Apron's freshness guarantee you can be sure that every ingredient in your delivery will arrive ready to cook or they'll make it right i love getting that blue apron box delivered and here's some of the stuff they're sending in april spinach and fresh mozzarella pizza with olives bell peppers and ricotta salada parmesan crusted chicken with creamy fettuccine and roasted broccoli and baby broccoli and fontina paninis with hard-boiled egg and arugula salad check out this week's menu you get your first three meals free with free shipping by going to blueapron.com slash marin you will love how good it feels and tastes to create incredible home-cooked meals with blue apron so don't wait that's blueapron.com slash marin blue apron a better way to cook Paul Schaefer, uh, like I said before, he's got a, a new record out, Paul Schaefer and the World's Most Dangerous Band, uh, which is the band Paul led on the Late Show with David Letterman. There are guest vocals by Dion, Jenny Lewis, Bill Murray, and more. They're kicking off a national tour on April 1st in New York, and they'll be playing through the summer. I was very happy to have the odd, but, uh, but candid and, and amazingly uh, talented Paul Schaefer here in the garage, and this is me and Paul Chatting it up. When was the last time I saw you, Paul? Well, I think that in uh, in the roast. Exactly. That horrible. The auspicious Chevy Chase roast. You know about that. The I was there. You saw me bomb. I was the roast bat. You, nothing mattered. You didn't bomb. You didn't bomb. <laughs> nothing mattered. Not, when, <laughs> when, when Chevy got on and 
he had been taking yeah. notes. He had been taking notes all yeah. through the film. Yeah. You thought, boy, when he comes on, he's going to kill. He's he, going to really lay it he's out. He's going to give it back to everybody that... Uh, and uh, and he really had nothing. 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 And no, he just said, wow, that was rough. Did he say that to you? Wow, yeah. Well, no, I just said to the audience. Yeah. I, th- I feel like he was not a great sport about it the whole the whole time. Yeah, he didn't really want to be doing it. Uh, yeah. He did it for his wife's charity. He kept saying, I'm doing it for my wife's charity. Yeah, and, yeah. And he took some hits, but he didn't take them well. It but was that's a little a, misguided. Well, it wasn't, he wasn't at the top of his career at that time, you know, so he wasn't really the right guy to roast. He's very diplomatic. Are you guys old friends? Like, is he in your phone? Yeah. Home? Well, yes, yes. Yes, he's in my phone. That's a good way of putting it. He is, and even after that night, you yeah, know, right. I was a little rough on him too, but, uh, he but you, was good. But that was, you don't always do those roasts. I mean, that was sort of a rare thing. I, I have a hard time believing that's the last time I saw you, cause, uh, but I guess it probably is. Man, you know, no, that's not true. I think on my last Letterman appearance, that was long after. I talked about uh, meeting Mel Brooks and talking to Mel Brooks. Oh, Bo- I do remember that. Yeah, yes, yeah. Yes. That was the last time. I, now, is Dave in your phone? Yes, yes. <laughs> but it was a secret name, you know. I don't yeah. want to you, you lose, lose your the phone. phone. Yeah, and everybody calling him up. Well, now he seems like he's chatty. He's chatty these days, Dave. Well, he certainly, I mean, he doesn't have the opportunity to do it every single night. And right. no one's forcing him to do it every single right. night. Uh, it looks like he's having a great time to me. He is. And he, he adjusted to, uh, you know, the change in schedule, if you would. Sure. Uh, it must be such a fucking relief, man. I don't know why people work so hard after a certain point. You got enough money. What are you doing? I don't know. You just think you've got to do it. You've got to complete it. Really? Know? And as Dave himself has said, you, you get the feeling when you're doing it like it's the most important thing in the world. Right. And now he realizes, you know what, it wasn't so important. <laughs> it's just show business. But it's funny, though, it's a, a different thing with music because music does ultimately can have a life for for a long time. You know, I mean, obviously some Letterman clips, are, you know, you go back and watch shows, but music stays there. Mm-hmm. Right. It's raining men will be there forever, Paul. Thank you. Thank you. My accountant certainly hopes you're right about that. <laughs> you did all right on that song. I never thought it would have the, the legs, if you will. I didn't uh, even know you did it until it today. Did. Yes, I know. Yes, I'm, well, I'm the, I wrote the music yeah. for it. My co-writer was the late, great Paul Jabaro, who wrote uh, Last Dance for Donna Summer and stuff. Last Dance. And, that was yeah. a good era for that kind of music. And he, he won an Oscar. He, for that? For that, yes. And then he called me up and said, because uh, I had done some arranging for him. Yeah. Early disco experimental. Right. He had, he had a song called One Man Ain't Enough. Yeah. And we, you know, we made that record with him singing it. He was already working towards <laughs> This groovy <laughs> concept you can see. One man ain't enough. Ain't enough, yeah. yeah. And then it's raining men. Yeah. Uh, anyway, he had all the lyrics ready to go, you know, and I was happy to be able to put music to him and, uh, and, and made I, a little money. I well, became a co-writer. A little, a little, a little, little scratch. A little, a little scratch. scratch yeah. yeah, yeah. But uh, the, the the thing about you is, like, you're one of those people in my life who, like, I remember forever. Like, you know, you have a place in my mind. I've watched you grow up on television. I know. <laughs> I was young when I started. I, you know, I, I, I remember, you know, different versions of hair. They had different comb overs, yes. <laughs> several different yeah. approaches to the comb over. And I was combing over and making fun of guys who combed over. Yeah, at the same and time. And yet doing it at the same yeah. time. It was but, an ironic comb over, but it was real. Yeah, but not looking at myself full on in the mirror. I would only look through squinted eyes. I didn't really want to see <laughs> I imagine that's what, what I look like. What most people do with comb over. I imagine our president does that every day. Looks exactly. right. Looks yeah. perfect. Yeah, well, you got yeah, You Terrific. put a little of Vaseline on the lens, you can get away with anything. But we're, like, because I talked to, uh, yeah, I talked to Eugene Levy. Yes. I talked to the Reitmans, uh, Ivan and the Sun. I've talked to the Canadians, you know, that come out of, uh, of the world you come out of. And, uh, I didn't, you, I mean, you were born there, right? You were like a Canadian. Certainly. Born, yes, born in Toronto, uh, raised in Thunder Bay, Ontario, uh, on the north shore of Lake Superior. Do you miss, do you miss Canada ever? Well, I love Canada, of course. Yeah. It is my... You have to. My country of yeah. origin. Yeah. You know, I'm very proud to be a Canadian, but I'm an American now. Yeah. And I'm very proud to be here, too. You're, but you're, are you a citizen of both places? Yes, yes, I am. Yes. Have, uh, do you ever think, like, I gotta... Maybe I'm heading back. Ah, uh, <laughs> no one's gone back yet. Yeah. I was going to go up there and get into real estate. I thought that would be the way to go. And sell to Recently? all... To all, yes, to sell to all the terrified Americans right. that are running up there. But you don't know anyone who's I don't back. see anybody going up there yet. Not yet. No, let's see. Are you, you have any plans? You could do this from Vancouver. It's very nice I there. I could do it know. from everywhere. In have fact, even... driving out here, I thought I was going to Vancouver. 
Well, that's so yeah. Long. Except that, that you don't have that weird uh, uh, similarity of uh, buildings. I, when I when I work Vancouver, I say this is this city looks like it was built from a kit all at once. It's sort of new, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's a, the, well the modern the mod, the modernity oui. in uh, in I'm Canada. In French, yes, yeah, it's very good. Uh, it, it's similar. There there there's a lot of glass. The buildings all you know. It's yeah. like. One kind of angle, you know. There's not. There's the old stuff, That's and right. then there's these things. They don't reverse the angle. No, words. no, no, yeah, yeah. no. They don't get any of the reverse shots. But like, what, like, did you grow up in a city? The in, town I'm, uh, 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 the town I grew up in, Thunder Bay, was. Yeah. When I was there, it was about 140,000. Oh, so that doesn't that's sound great. tiny, right? But it was isolated, right? Oh, really? It had its own thing. It wasn't near anything. Yeah. Four hours, and you'd get to Duluth, Minnesota. Oh. And that was basically just the same as Thunder Bay. So, you know? Yeah, you don't want to these travel. Are shipping town. Well, I mean, not much there. Well, but you didn't stay in Toronto. How far is it from Toronto? I was born there. I was only there to. It's a thousand miles northwest oh of Toronto. So I was in Toronto to get born, and then then I was, way up there. Yeah, and then I went up there. Yeah, that's my dad was from. My dad my, brought my mother up there. Yeah, and my dad was a lawyer up there. He was from know. there. From there. How yeah. did like what? How how did Jews make it? It's hard to say. Uh, <laughs> I, I've asked, and nobody remembers. <laughs> no. They came. My father's family came. From Austria, uh, and they came through Ellis Island, you know, immigrated. They did, and then they... The way, and somehow, I guess they must have heard there was opportunity north. Yeah. And they went, they lived in West Orange, I think, New Jersey for a while, then up to Canada, then back, and then up again. I don't know why, but... What, what bracket was your grandfather in? Um, he, at the time, uh, my dad's father had a, a Western Iron and Metals, you know, scrap metal company. Oh, okay. Shipping, putting it, loading it on these uh, uh, steamers. So he and went out and got out. scrap metal from buildings Finding and sites? It, yeah, that's right. De de demolishing cars. Oh, and, like a little, uh, el a higher level junk man. Exactly. That's what he was. And he yeah. had a compressor thing, you know, you put a coal car in there and it comes out a little, did a you little get square to... comes out. No, I never did any of that. I used to go visit though. But you'd go to the site and you'd watch him yes, squish cars? Yes, I remember the, yeah, what, what it was like, big piles of scrap. The, the was, car squisher? Yeah. He had a car squisher. I had a squisher, yeah. yeah. It came yeah. with a squisher. Yeah. So it was northern scrap metal, western iron and metal, it was called, that was the family business. Uh huh. Uh, and your dad didn't want to go into that. He, no, he went, he went to Toronto, uh, University of Toronto and became a lawyer. And went back up there, and he did all kinds of law, wills, yeah. accident cases, you know, divorces, criminal, everything. Yes, everything. And, and your mom did what? Homemaker, one yeah. of the hardest job in the world. Where's that? Where does he? And how many siblings? No, no, only child. Really? Yeah. Don't you have like twelve kids? I have two kids. Oh, really? I don't know why I thought you were one of those guys. Yeah, no, like... two. And and you know, one was enough. I thought this is it. How many more can you have? My, my wife had three brothers, so she wanted Another at least one, one more. Yeah, you keep the one company. I didn't get it. I didn't yeah. get it as an only child. I thought, great. Yeah, we got you, it. You got all the. Were you an only child as well? I was not, and uh -huh. I and I'm always fascinated with only children. I've I've tried to insinuate on every only child I've talked to that there must have been a lot of pressure not to die. Ah, uh -huh. well, you <laughs> certainly get all the attention. Yeah, that's. What, and, I think that's the positive way to look at it. And you have privacy. You know, yeah. I loved my life. Uh, and then, but now that I have two, I see. I see what my wife is talking about. Yeah, you it's know. better. I, I had a, yeah, and one needs a, the older one needs to have someone to beat up on. You see, know, like if no one's getting beat up, no one learns anything. Yeah, but the younger <laughs> one doesn't necessarily. That can't love. be true. Sorry, <laughs> that, I just improvised that, and I realize it's a horrible that's way to look right. at life. Yes, well, it is. But uh, but you know, so you were just all alone there in the house. Listening Let, to the radio, you know, picking up American radio channels after dark. Uh huh. We could hear the big WLS fifty thousand watts AM radio from Chicagoland. Oh yeah. And every night they played the top three most requested songs in Chicagoland. Yeah. And I was listening every night, you know, pretending to be a Chicagoan. Right. And, and so, what, 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 what kind of station was that? R and B or was it uh, pop, pop? Pop music. You know, go on. Uh, we talking the fifties? Yeah. Well, we're talking the sixties. Okay. You know, maybe Early mid sixties. Mid sixties. I mean, top three most requested songs. Wonderful Summer by Robin Ward was up there. Yeah. Uh, Only in America, Jane the Americans. So this must have been 1963. Right. These were the, the tunes that I remember. So and all the music. local Chicago bands that we would hear, like yeah. the Crying Shames. Right. The Buckinghams. Yeah. You know, kind yeah. of a drag. I, yeah. Th that, I, I heard all that after dark. It was like a lifeline. Right. To the U.S. So it was like it was pop happening. music before everything got weird. Beatles era. A little Early bit Beatles. Yeah. And you, you were, you went, you were playing nothing yet. 
I was taking piano lessons as a child. You were classical piano lessons. I started at six years old. How are you at that stuff? Can you can you lay it out? How's I your? I can't anymore. How are your sight reading skills? No good. No but, good. But I had a great ear yeah. for music, and I was teaching myself how to play pop music by ear. You can you can ear out chords on the piano. Yes. Yes. No kidding. Yeah. And when I started, the music was very simple. You know. Uh, Wonderful summer. There are only three chords in there. You know, that's, that's all you need. You learn the three. You can play everything. I see your guitars. You're a guitarist. <laughs> yeah, I'm a I'm a three chord guitarist. I see. So I'm I'm very good at three chords. Well, I kind of learned along with rock and roll. The fourth chord came in. You know, a little the more R and B. Yeah, that yeah. that six minor chord. Yeah. <laughs> then you could play all the R and B songs. Right. Hundred pounds of clay was yeah. a big one for me by G McDaniel. Sure. Sure. C A minor. Yeah. F G. You know. Yeah. Perfect. And then a fifth chord. You know, you had to learn the three, and yeah. you had to learn the two. Then you get into B. Beatles territory. The fifth That's chord. right. Well, <laughs> yes, and uh, so I gradually developed my ear as the music developed, and I, I I cheated on my lesson. You know, I would watch and listen to the teacher play the yeah. piece, and then just regurgitate it and play it by rote. Oh, you as can they used to say. without without reading it. Just, just yeah, just memorizing it, it and hearing it and watching it and playing it by rote. But you never really connected with the classical stuff. I loved it, yeah. but you know, once I heard the Four Seasons. <laughs> Forget it. I Sherry. was done. That sound. Yeah. Sherry baby, big yeah. girls don't cry, walk like a man, rag doll. They were your, they were your guys. They huh? were, yeah, yeah. And when the Beatles came out, you know, initially I, I didn't even care. I was still reeling from having seen the four seasons on Ed Sullivan. Yeah. Doing big girls don't cry. There was something about that sound. The way they looked, I'd never seen guys. We didn't have guys that looked like that, or and, sounded that like, or that. sounded like. He that. was yeah. high, man. He was high. It was yeah. like they said, walk like a man, sing like a girl. <laughs> He could get up there, yeah, but the whole vocal sound they had was just amazing. And you you heard that sound of the city, the yeah. street, you know. Yeah, you think? I said, get me down there. I felt it anyway. You felt I the sound felt of the street in the Four Seasons. In the Four Seasons, You might yeah. be the only guy. Well, maybe so. I don't think so, though. They were from Jersey, <laughs> and, you know, well, metal was clinking. It just sounded like New York. Well, know? on this new record uh, with the world's most dangerous band, you got Dion out of... Uh, How you know, about that? Yeah. Wait, he Like, he gets so much respect... You know, from like interesting people like yourself, obviously you have him on the tune, and Lou Reed loved him. Yes. Yeah, Springsteen yeah. loves him. I mean, there are people that like I didn't really like. I recently got some of the later Dion stuff, and I yeah, I didn't realize till not too long ago sort of his struggle. I mean, I, I mean, Run Around Sue, that stuff was great. Yeah. But then after that, like when he went through the the horrible yeah, drug addiction and yes, everything. Yeah, but he survived. Came out the other end. But he puts out records all the time. I didn't realize this. Small label records, blues records. He loves the blues and does blues records, yeah. Well, you know, he, I don't think he'd mind my saying he's 75 years old. Yeah. But he said, the way he sings on my record is like a bird. He, he, his vocal on this Sam Cooke obscure, he does this obscure Sam Cooke song that I had never heard before. He chose it? Uh, you know who chose it? Seymour Stein. The great Seymour record. Sire Records. Yes. The guy who signed it. Were the Ramones on Sire? Yes. The Ramones for Talking Heads. Seymour and I became friends over all the years of doing the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame induction dinners together. And he called me up after Letterman and said, you know, you want to get back in the record business and sign me up. And it's on Sire. I'm on Sire. That's great. I'm like Madonna. And, and Rhino is the parent company. Rhino now? really made it. But right. I don't know. So they're calling it sure, Sire. Sire. And then For all time's sake. Yeah, and you were able to do that. Uh, I watched that thing on Funny or Die where you uh, rev revive the uh, character from Spinal Tap. Yes, yes. And uh, had fun. And I got to say, Sire, name? Artie Fufkin. Artie Fufkin. And he kept saying, now, Artie Fufkin, Sire Records, how are you? Artie Fufkin, Came Sire Came right Records. back to you, didn't it? Came right back to you. It was hilarious, actually. <laughs> the first take I forgot. Yeah. That there was a voice. Mm -hmm. And then uh, by the end of it, I was sort of doing the voice. And the then guy. I remember... Let me, oh, I remember now, and I got it. Kick me in the ass. By the second time, I was kicking myself in the ass. <laughs> Fun to do, but then, and then whose song is that? Like I get, I was listening to the Jenny Lewis song. Is that David Bowie's song? It was one of the songs that he covered on that record called Pinups. Right. Whose original song is it? The Kinks. Whose is it? The, the, well, the McCoys originally. Like Sorrow. A, a follow up. Yeah. Follow up to Hang On Sloopy, but it was covered in England by the Merseys. Yeah. Also known as the Mersey Beats, I think. Yeah. And that's where Bowie heard it. And he what a great it. fucking song! Yes, and Jenny doesn't Jenny sound beautiful on it? Really good, beautiful. You got yeah. Bill Murray really singing. He sounds really good. He, sa he? he like he, it sounds like he wa he was in it. He He's was he wasn't mocking it. Spent the whole afternoon working on it and doing a as many takes as we wanted. You know, he really wanted to get it right. It was kind of touching for me. Yeah, uh, we're old old friends since before Saturday Night Live. Oh, really? Yeah, from back in the Canadian well, days. Well, you know, his his older brother was Brian Doyle Murray. 
Yeah, he's not alive anymore. No, he is. Oh, okay. I said I don't know. I said was okay. Ah, <laughs> uh, but he at that because I'm thinking back, and in, in those early seventies, he and Joe Flaherty came up to Toronto to teach to cast and form SCTV? A Second City Nightclub. This pre was before SCTV. First well, let's, would, let's, let's, let's walk through it. Let's okay. walk through the Canada stuff. So, so you're a kid who's uh, listening to music and able to play it and outsmarting your piano teacher. Yeah. But when do you start, uh, you know, working as a musician? Went to Toronto to go to school. Yeah. University of Toronto. Graduated, degree in sociology. Yeah. Uh, and then how, just, how did that serve you? Well, well, you know, it's, it, there is something about it. a band leader has got to work with people. Right. He's right in between, you know, with management on one side and employees on the other. He's got to play music with the people and also be the leader. It's just tough little uh, yeah. sociological sure. experiment, right. right? Right there, you know. Got to be diplomatic. It he, has, yeah. So it has really. Because there's hey, you, and then there's Buddy Rich, exactly. And you want to find a, a nice somewhere, medium. yeah. You don't want one of those tapes about, you know, where you're yelling. You guys at are you. blowing clams out there. Although I'm sure one of those exists about me. Every band leader loses it. Yeah, have you point, lost it? At some point, or who are you going to yell at? I, Will? I lost it one time. One, one time. time when Darlene Love. The, the great yeah. uh, rock and roll singer who yeah. used to come on Letterman every every day, every, every Christmas, and do her original Christmas song yeah, yeah. from the Chris, uh, Phil Spector Christmas album. Well, she sang it so beautifully one day, and then uh, one time on the sh- on the show, and then sang Silent Night during the commercial gospel style. Yeah. The snow was falling, people were crying, and we came out. And the show ended. Good night, everybody, and I start yelling at. Darlene? Stage. Yeah, well, it was, it had been not Darlene, a stage manager who didn't deserve it. But it had been a long day, a lot of things yeah. going wrong, you know. Yeah. And something happened, and I just started right in front of the audience. Really? Yeah. Lost screaming at them. S- swearing yeah. at them. Yes. And then, you know, somebody wrote into page six, well, I thought I liked Paul Schaefer until I saw this show. He ruined Christmas. <laughs> I ruined Christmas for that whole audience. <laughs> But I apologized, and uh, you know, I said, "Oh, there, I, I just heard the Canadian." I'm I mean, an I, asshole. Apologized. I heard it. Eh? eh? I heard it. Eh? I heard it's in there. Anyway, what, what did Dave say? Did he talk you down? He he was, was, yeah, he said you have every right to do that. <laughs> very supportive of me. God love him. You know. <laughs> I don't know. Everyone's entitled. Well, thank you. So, all right. So, you're at University of Toronto. You're doing your sociology. Yeah. When I graduated, I, I started playing uh, music in town. You know, see. What happens to take take a year? I made a deal with my parents. Sure. Take a year for try show business. See what happens. Maybe I'll go to grad. If it doesn't work out, I'll go to grad. So school. you're in Toronto. And yeah. You're, and what are you playing? Where are you ha- playing? Where are you out doing? Uh, uh, what they used to call casuals, uh, bar mitzvahs, weddings. By yourself or with a uh, with, with pickup the... bands? You know, looking at there was. A, but you were leading things. them. You were like. No, know, no. I would get about. You know, we need a keyboard player Saturday. You know, I was in a band once that went. On, and, and played at missile bases in northern Quebec in the middle of winter, freezing like 30, 40 below. And Just doing covers? Quebec, doing whatever they had to do, yes, of course. It was whatever all, we had to do. Well, whatever was out, yes, yeah. it was covers, yeah. Uh, J- uh, 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 Tom Jones, daughter of darkness. <laughs> Stay out of my life, my life. That was Were one. you singing? I used to sing a little bit, yeah. <laughs> Games people, old game people playing now. You know, I can summon it up when I have to. I've seen you sing a couple of times. Yeah, yeah, I sing. I open yeah. my mouth. I sing a little bit on the record, actually. Yeah, wait, made, one or two tunes, right? Yeah, two tunes. They made me sound pretty good. And you're me. playing with the old guys. How, I mean, like, geez, some of those guys you've been playing with for what, 40 years? Well, Will, Will Lee, uh, on, Forever. on bass, yes, was on the very first show of Letterman in 82. Before that, we were doing sessions together. I met him in the recording studio. I remember. Oh, really? That, yeah. you, that's what you we were... used to do. Barry Manilow records together. He played on every, all those early hits. I played on some of them. And he's like a very un, like bass guys are interesting because they're so important, but they're they're unassuming a lot of times. They're just kind of that's Will. He's just there. I remember the guitar. I remember. You know, I remember. I remember um, Hiram. Yes, yes. From the late, the, the late great Hiram, but he died. You know. No. Oh, uh, my think first I that. guitarist. Nobody could. I mean, he was up there with Hendrix Harum. He was. Yeah, it's great. I used to love up. watching him. I remember one night Don Rickles came out, and the first thing he said is, "Hiram, how are you, Hiram? You're black. I'm white. That's the breaks." Oh, I, I remember. You yeah. remember that? Yeah. He can't. You can't get away with that stuff anymore. No, you can't. But he paid me such a great compliment that same Who, show Don? when Don Rickles. Turned oh, you to me remember that night? Oh, are you kidding? Of course. He turned to me and he said, "Paul." Have yourself committed. And I was in heaven. You know, Don Rickles has done a line on me. I can retire. Well, let's go back to Canada. So you're doing, you're doing missile bases. Yes, and. Singing uh, Tom Jones songs. Sometimes I used to accompany people for auditions. 
20 bucks, you could come over to my house and we'd learn a song together and then I'd go and play for you at your audition. And one girl was going to audition for a Broadway, an off-Broadway New York uh, show, 70s show called Godspell. It was a rock music. In Toronto. Yeah, this Toronto is the, Company. Uh, this the is, this show. is the production. In Toronto, it was like that. When hair hit town, yeah. everybody auditioned. Right. Same with Godspell. Everybody right. auditioned. I went and played for this girlfriend of mine. And the Steve Schwartz was a composer, very famous now, uh, yeah. Broadway composer. And he said to me, can you uh, stay and play the rest of the auditions? Because the piano player doesn't <laughs> seem to know the songs that the people want to hear. And yeah. I knew all the songs, you yeah. know. So, yes, I played for the rest of the auditions. And then he hired me to conduct the show after that. Really? And then he hired all the funniest people that I thought, you know. Who was that friend you brought to the audition? Uh, her name was Avril yeah. Chown, a wonderful singer. Didn't make it, and another girl who I was dating at the time, Virginia Ron Setti, neither of them made it. Right, you know, kind of, but I, but I did. Oh no, Avril did get it. Avril got it. Yeah, did get the job. Are you kidding? Because she sang one of the songs from the show. Right, and that's when Schwartz got to hear me play one of his songs. You right, know? so he's, oh, he and, liked it. and I got this job. Uh, I never conducted or anything before. Yeah. But you know, so here's this company, which besides Avril, who was a terrific singer, you had Martin Short, yep. Eugene Levy, yep. Dave Thomas, uh-huh. Andrea Martin. Yeah. For my money, the funniest of them all. Yeah. Taught them all how so to be funny. funny. Yeah. Gilda Radner. Yeah. Victor Garber. Victor Garber. A straight actor, yes, who we know from Titanic. Sure. The, the guy oh. designed the ship. Exactly. Yeah. All these people in, in the same company. And I was saying, yeah, but this is great, but when I get to New York, man, that's when I'm going to see some talented people. Turned out I was wrong. These yeah. people are... Amazing. The funniest. Yeah. Yes. And still the funniest. Uh, and Martin Short, you guys still friends? We are still best of friends. In fact, all of us, we see each other all the time. It seems like you Canadians are good at that. We are. Some of us are loyal. Marty sure is a, a very loyal friend. Too. i got to get him in here. He's like, uh, you know, after talking to Eugene, it was great. You know, I just realized, like, why have I not talked to him? Yeah. But, uh, alright, so, but like, are you, like, before you do this, you're, you're actually getting experience, but was there ever this sort of idea that, uh, you know, when you were doing these pickup gigs and that you were gonna be, did you play jazz? Did you, did you, did you, did you have any, uh, other ideas for yourself? I thought I would, I would be in a rock band, you know? Oh, yeah. I can't, you know, my, my singing was even worse than it is now. Yeah. So I thought, you know, but I gotta be in a band, somebody else will sing, and maybe, you know, and, that's all I thought for myself, and I, but but I was playing lounges and stuff, yeah. you know. And you could and you riff, you could, you and could stuff. riff, you get like I know you can now. Yes, and then I started to, you know, what happened to, when I was in first year, I'd given up my high school rock band, first year of college, trying to settle down, become an academic, got depressed as hell. Yeah, had to sleep all day long. Yeah, started playing a little avant-garde jazz. Yeah, in second year, I apprenticed with a guy who, with whom I still play. His name is Munoz, to C.G. Munoz. Yeah, a cosmically oriented avant-garde guitar. Like Sun Ra kind of. Yes, exactly. Yeah. And, Out Col- there. and Coltrane. Yeah. Taught me everything I know about that style of music. Enabled me to play with people like Miles Davis and Dizzy Gillespie later when they would come on Letterman. Still play with this guy. And I cheered up when I started playing with him and I said, well, I gotta do music. It's, it's obvious. So that's interesting. So you were in a rock band in high school doing, you know, playing what? Covers, what, Rascals. What were you playing? A Rhodes? Or? I was playing a Honer. I started with a Honer electronic organ. Uh-huh. About three and a half octaves, you know, on legs. Yeah. Sort of like the organ you'd see all the English bands using, but couldn't afford that one. Right. That was the Vox. And then, yeah. I, and then I graduated to a big Yamaha organ, still on legs, you know, the kind that you could put in a case and slide into the back of your Pontiac. Which sure. Is my parents' car that I used to right. drive to the gig. And then what, what be, and so, like, so you're, what, the rock band, you're just doing covers, Beatles and stuff? That's it. We had no, uh, aspirations to do original material so, or anything, but it was still a great outlet. So how'd you hook up with this guy? How do you pronounce his name? Munoz. So the second year, you're depressed. Yeah. You're well, trying to do the right thing. In the and, summer, between first and second year, I stayed in Toronto. Yeah. I, I, you know, playing in a band, getting, making more money than I would have. Made but working for Canada Car or something back up if yeah. I'd gone home. Yeah. Playing and, and staying up all night, coming home about 6 a.m., walking through the village. They had their own kind of Greenwich Village sure. up there called Yorkville. And a guy is sitting down on the step of a, of a deli playing guitar and I walk three paces and then I turn around immediately go back and I'm zero in on him like a magnet because he was playing stuff that was fascinating and I had no idea. On an what acoustic he was doing. guitar. Yeah. And I said, what are you do- on an acoustic? Yeah. yeah. What is that stuff? And he basically said, well, I'll show you. I mean, you're a player? I said, well, I play a piano, but I don't know what. He says, well, you have a piano now? I said, well, I, you know, there's a practice hall over at the university. So let's go. And at like 7, 8 a.m., we're over there. And he starts 
showing me stuff right away, and I started apprenticing with him right away. And what what, just to learn. what was the key to that stuff? Uh, well, first he started me on jazz standards. Yeah. Like my parents' music. Yeah. That I knew, but couldn't figure out those chords. Right. Bigger chords. Right. You know, yeah, a little yeah. more flatted nice. He knew, and he knew like piano that. or he just... He just knew musical theory. Right. And he could play it for me on the guitar and then right. I could... Figure it you know, out. Figure it out on the piano. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And then he said, okay, now we forget all those chords. Now we just play one chord. <laughs> yeah. And just see what happens <laughs> and let me take... And little by little he just... Taught me the principles behind that kind of uh, between, of playing, of yeah. improvisation, atonal yeah. stuff. Yeah, and yeah. And did and you guys play together out? Did you do? We two? used to play. Yeah, sometimes just a duo. Yeah. Well, we'd play at a little restaurant or a place like a community hall and uh-huh. stuff. It was hippie era, you know. Yeah. Girls in long flowered skirts dancing yeah. and stuff with flowers. Yeah, and just that. the two of you though. Yes, and then sometimes we would have a rhythm section too, but. It was a, a learning, a really strong learning experience. And that me. paid off. So like when some, when you had to play with someone like Miles early on towards the end of his life, I imagine. Yes. Right? Yes. That I you know, could do it. You exactly. could lock in. You're like, I know what he's doing. I, well, not exactly, but he <laughs> gave me some amazing lessons too, Miles. Yeah. Uh, when I got to play with him. What'd he say? Uh, well, Paul, you know, Paul. You know <laughs> yeah, you know, I, <laughs> I, I, uh, he was doing, I, the thing I did for, with him was, a part of a Bill Murray movie called Scrooge. Yeah. Where Billy telling a you know, Christmas Carol story. Or yeah. Playing a TV exec or something. And there's a minute when he's walking down the street and he walks by a group of street musicians. Yeah. But the street musicians are Miles and Dave Sanborn and I, me and Larry Carlton. Uh-huh. And it lasts only about six seconds, the yeah. shot. Right. But we got to record a whole six-minute version of We Three Kings of Orionar with Miles arranging uh-huh. and showing us all how to play sort of like him. And I was playing the bass. Uh-huh. He kept coming over and encouraging me and so, even singing, bum, 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 bum. You know what I'm talking about? Yeah. What it, bum, 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 bum. Oh, you know, you know. And, yeah. and finally he came over, and this will make sense to you as, as a musician. He said, don't play the root. What? Don't play the root. In other words, we're in the key of C. Yeah, yeah. Never, never play a C. <laughs> play around it. Hint at it. Imply it. Don't play it. Wow. And when I started doing that, it floated the whole thing, and it all of a sudden sounded like, Bitches brew or right. something. You, you know? got it. That was one of the You keys. understood what he meant. Don't play the root. How do you play around I it? haven't played a root since. Really? <laughs> no, that's not true. But. How do you play around well, the root? Well, I don't know. You you sound like you're going. You play five, you know, and usually in music, five goes to one. Yeah. You know? Like in an arm. Ah, boom, 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 yeah, boom, yeah, boom, yeah, boom, yeah, boom. Yeah. So you play that five, you know, and everybody thinks you're going to go to the root, but you don't. <laughs> you know, you go to the sharp one and not the one and all these kind of things. This is what I learned from Miles. It was a million dollar music lesson. Yeah, I bet. Yeah. I talked to Crosby in here once, David. Yeah. And he said that, uh, you know, Miles had told him that he covered Guinevere and, you know, he listened to it and he said, that's not Guinevere. And, and I, I tracked it down. I think it's, uh, it's in the Bitches Brew, uh, sessions. Mm-hmm. I don't know if it made the record, but I could hear Guinevere. I mean, like, you well, know, and it makes sense what you're saying. So you can hear it and David Crosby can't hear it. Yeah. I don't know why. No idea why, no. No, I mean, it's his song. <laughs> yes. I guess you're a little more attached to it. And if you're going, if you're playing around the root and you wrote the song, you're probably saying like, that ain't the song. Play the root. Yeah, Miles, play the root. Playing <laughs> out of here, play the root. That's what he's saying. So you, so you got all these chops from this dude. Yes, uh, uh, it, it taught me a lot. Not about rock and roll, but, but just to be, you know, about expanding one's horizons beyond rock and roll. And so that, like, it gives you a certain fearlessness. Helped it? me out at, later on when I yeah. started getting these opportunities to play with, uh, you know, jazz people and people from, say, the previous generation. Sure. And so when Schwartz gives you this gig yeah. to do Godspell, it was Godspell, right? That's right. Right. So you'd never really let an orc, like, you, you had to, what did you have to do? What was the job? Yes, lead it. But luckily, it was a four-piece band. It was a four-piece rock band. It's a rock thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah it's yeah. a rock show. Right. So it was perfect. And the piano, very heavily piano based, like yeah. Elton John kind right. of stuff and Laura Nero, yeah, yeah. you know. Yeah. Steve Schwartz wrote uh, with that in mind. So I had to just play that stuff. And really, uh, the drummer was the conductor. Yeah. You know, as in a lot of rock bands, everybody turns to look at the drummer right. for the last chord. You know, yeah, well, yeah. that was kind of happening in gospel too. So I didn't have to conduct, which I had no idea how to do anyway. Sure. Drummer was kind of conducting, and we all made it work that way. And we were a, a little rock band. It took me a long time to appreciate drummers for the full uh, the, what they deserve, you know? 
They are everything. They, if, you know, if the drums make you dance, then you're going to dance. And if the drums aren't groovy, right, you throw the whole but thing you gotta, out. Like the cats who, like, you got to be able to swing, right? You do. I mean, it sounds like a cliche, but, but there is something to some it. Some dudes can't. Swing, groove, whatever you want to call right. it. Whatever it is, this is, that's what makes you want to dance. I yeah. had this weird thing with the, the reissue of Get Your Yaya's Out. Yeah. Where, where I didn't, you know, cause I've been a Stones fan all my life, but something about that reissue brought, you know, Bill and Charlie up. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, holy shit, this whole thing would fall apart. There's just nothing holding them together but those two guys. They knew, even then, they knew that that was their function. You <laughs> hold it together, play together, and that yeah. way anybody can do anything sure, they want they, on the top yeah, of it. Yeah, Keith can go. But yes, it's all in the drums, and that's why they all bow down to Charlie Watts. At the end, you know, they give him the salam, <laughs> they could, especially at his age. Yeah. The other thing people don't understand, every song, and every rock and roll song for the drummer is like running a mile. Right. I it's know. so physical. I don't know how they do it. I don't know how they keep time. Well, I don't either, but they gotta be in shape. Like, because you're for, who's the first guy you, was Jordan the first guy mm-hmm. on the? Yes. Steve, and then Anton. Steve Jordan. That's Steve right. Jordan, he's like a miracle guy. He's like, now, now he's a huge record producer. Yeah. Fabulous. I mean, he produced the Keith Richards solo the last stuff. One. Did you listen to that blues record they just made? It's pretty yes, good. Yes, yes, it's really good. It is, right? Yeah. Are you friends with Don Was? Uh, a little bit, yeah. yeah. I've known him from when he used to come on and let him was not was. Yeah, yeah. Oh, God, yeah. And now he's right. the hugest. Yeah, too. he's big, he's too. wonderful. I'm, I'm so everyone's big. You're huge. I don't know. What do you mean? I don't know. I'm here with you, Mark, so that that's why I'm, I'm sitting in the stairs. Did Keith Richards sit right here? No, Obama sat there. Obama sat here? Are you I was, kidding? I was in New York with Keith Richards. Unbelievable. Yeah. There you go. So you want to talk about who's big. Yeah, yeah. You know, that's you know. a, he was a hell of a band leader, Obama. Hey, oh, well, he could sing. <laughs> yeah. Turned out he could sing. <laughs> yeah, he's all right. But, uh, all right, so now you do Godspell. So how do you get involved with the funny people? Where... Yeah, after that, so do you, are you- We were all, it was all our first professional job. You know, Eugene was about 24 or 5. Yeah. And Marty and I 22, you know, Gilda yeah. maybe around the same as Eugene. It was all our first real- But Gilda wasn't Canadian, right? She, she was, was dating not. She was somebody. From, she, exactly. She was from De- Detroit and she followed her boyfriend up to- Yeah. Canada, and right. she became a landed immigrant up there. Yeah. Uh, you know, got her legal status, and she was staying there. Oh, okay. Until they brought her back. They pulled her back down here, you know, to do... Uh, right. Well, how did that unfold for you? Like, what was your next gig after I that? was doing uh, Gospel. I did it for a year. We all hung out incessantly. We became very close friends. Talked about the show and show business incessantly, nonstop. Yeah. And I was so influenced by all these people and their personalities. And they're just coming up themselves. They and they, they just seem to be having more fun with their lives <laughs> yeah. than I was and so I thought let me become a little more like them and yeah. sure enough you know there are more laughs to be had sure. when you have that attitude towards life right so they were very influential and, and how did you how did how did the SNL gig what well, was the next space? thing that happened was uh, Stephen Schwartz said I want you to come to New York you know yeah. after I did his show up there for a year yeah. come to New York I'm doing a show with Doug Henning the magician called the Magic Show I saw that show you saw it well you probably heard me on the, when on I was the a piano. kid I saw yeah it. imagine that yeah and Eugene Levy brought it up I had no idea it was Canadian I had no idea that you know that Schwartz was involved with it but I remember while well, going with my grandmother yeah. To see that, yeah, that weird little hippie guy. I Isn't heard that? you guys talk about Doug. Yes. <laughs> yeah. He was a hippie magician, yeah. and it was so interesting because he didn't wear the top hat and tails. It's like and a tie dye shirt, I think. Kind of one of us, yeah, yeah, and cute with long hair, but Is he's... he alive still? No, poor guy. Oh. Yeah, died. Hmm. Um, became a follower of the Maharishi. Oh, as yeah. so many did. Yes, and then I think, you know, he got sick and he thought maybe, you know, he could heal himself through uh, meditation and he really, what he really needed was some medicine. Yeah, go to the doctor. Poor, yeah. Poor guy. Mm-hmm. Anyway, so I came, Schwartz brought, brought me into the States and I played in the pit in the magic show with Doug and I learned all his tricks. I watched every night from behind <laughs> yeah. and I had to sign a uh, you know, a confidentiality. Yeah. yeah, yeah, you won't tell yeah. the tricks. But I must say, you know, Doug, uh, well, he was very hot. He was a Broadway star. Yeah. So there was a lot. He did pretty well as a single guy. He yeah. got around a little bit. Yeah, you know? yeah. And one sure. person that he had one date with was Gilda. Uh-huh. Gilda Radner. Yeah. Took her out. Yeah. Uh, didn't call her afterwards. Oh. She was so upset, and you know, yeah. talking to me. Doug didn't call me, and I got so mad. That I sat her down and I told her every trick, how every trick was done. You know, these are the secrets. <laughs> He's a con all. man. Yeah, he watch this. Yeah. He's not really magic. It's an illusion. Yeah. yeah. So from there, like, did you meet musicians there? Like, you know, I mean, like, how did, like, okay, so you do the magic show for how long? 
I, I did it a year. Yeah. And uh, at the end of that, um, Howard Shore was the name of Lauren Michaels' band leader, who came down from, also Canadian, came down to be the musical director of Saturday Night Live. At the very beginning. Yeah, 75. So when did Bill Murray fall into place? Did you, you had met oh, Bill? Oh, oh, when I got to New York, uh, while playing the magic show, I loved the National Lampoon. Right. Uh, records that yeah. came out. I remember that so clearly this one. Christmas. National Lampoon radio show. Yeah, yeah, they had a radio hour and then they put out comedy albums yeah, too. Right, the Lemmings and, yeah. Yes, yeah, so yeah. there was one where there was a sketch, Chris Guest as Bob Dylan. Yeah. Selling on a TV ad, greatest protest hits of the sixties. Yeah, you know, yeah, being so commercial. Plus, if you order now, you get my own Masters of War. Call now, you know. But <laughs> yeah. it's Dylan. Yeah. And I thought, boy, that's funny. Yeah. That's what I want to do. And Billy's older brother Brian, who I mentioned earlier, he introduced me around right away when I got to New York to some National Lampoon people. That was his scene. I met Chris. Yeah. And I met uh, and I met Billy, his younger brother. He said, you got to meet my brother. You guys have the same kind of a yeah, yeah. sense of humor, you know. So before long, I was doing stuff for the Lampoon, and Billy and I did a song together, actually, for their Christmas show, which was called Kung Fu Christmas. Uh-huh. As you remember, in the early 70s, yeah. all, Rhythm and Everybody Bruce was, was Kung Fu fighting. Everybody was yeah. about Kung Num-chops. Fu. Yeah, no yeah. matter what. It, it, yeah. R&B was Kung Fu. So right. we said, what if there was an R&B record called Kung Fu Christmas? And Billy <laughs> sang it. We worked on it together. Gilda was one of the writers, Brian, too. For National Lampoon Radio yeah, Hour? Yeah, Radio Hour. Yeah, yeah. So you're part of that Chris Chevy was there, too, right? Yes, although I didn't meet Chevy yet. He How had been you? in Lemmings, but then I guess he moved to the coast right after that. Okay. So I didn't meet him. And then what, Belushi? Belushi was one of the first guys I met in, in Toronto. Doug Kenny. The legendary Doug Kenny. I was at Belushi's house, and Kenny was trying to sell Belushi, I think, on the idea of doing a live show. For the National Lampoon. Yeah, which they ended up doing in a midtown theater. All right, so you're doing the National Lampoon Radio right now. Howard Shore is the the musical director yeah. for the beginning of SNL, when That's it right. was like a variety show more than anything else. Well, certainly there were two musical guests instead of just one. Yeah. And, and they, they each did two songs, I think. The yeah. first musical guest was uh, Janice Ian, sure. doing at 17, mm-hmm. and then Billy Preston. Oh, uh, doing nothing from nothing? Yes, or yes. Mm-hmm. Or, uh, and I and I sneaked around, you know, during a break and looked at his organ and saw how he had it set up. Yeah? And I said, ah, you know, and I learned a few things. Do you like the way he plays? Stu- oh, he was a big, big influence. I had some of these early instrumental album, organ instrumentals, produced by Sly Stone up in San Francisco. Oh, yeah? I used to put him on, slow him down, trying to figure out what he did. Really? Uh, listen to that sound. How does he yeah, get yeah. that sound? So you're, you're hanging around, you're watching Billy Preston. How do you get the gig? Howard just hired me. He, he yeah, I had played a show with him in Toronto, and he just, like me, he knew I was in town already. He hired me, and I left the magic He's Canadian, show. too? Yes, he is, yeah. Now he's a huge movie writer, movie scorer. Howard hired me for the band, and then, you know, but I already knew Gilda, and I knew Belushi, I knew Aykroyd and stuff. It's very uh, natural for me to start working with them. I, well, I picture you hanging out with those guys as the, the laughing guy. Were you the one laughing? Absolutely. <laughs> laughing and remembering what, what people said. <laughs> oh, yeah? Sometime repeating it to myself, just to, my, just to lock it in. You were they the laughing it? guy. Just so I'd remember it later, and also I'd get a second laugh yeah. on their line, you know, by just repeating their... But did they ever come up to you and go like, Paul, you remember that thing we were doing? Sometimes do- they do, or sometimes <laughs> I will just remember that, and they'll say, that's funny. And I, I say, well, you should be. You said it. <laughs> what? Yeah. You said it in 1974. I do, I do have a crazy memory like that. Really? Yeah. Yeah. So, you so guys- we started, you know, in those days, Lauren used to have a Wednesday afternoon in a rehearsal studio just to kind of toss things around, like... Maybe come up with ideas, yeah. maybe come up with musical ideas. We were like a big Second City rep company right, when, when right. we first started. And I was the piano player. So and, I started developing stuff with them and writing stuff with them. Right. Well, I mean, I remember there was, there was a lot of musical numbers that throughout the years on SNL when you were there. Yes, and we would just start. I mean, the show wasn't locked into a format. Right. Two musical guests, you know, and then it went down to one. Well, who was the crew? The original Not Ready for Primetime yes, Players? Yes, so, so it's Chevy. Um, and Belushi and Aykroyd and, and Garrett. And then we had Jane Curtin, Lorraine Newman, Gilda Radner. Right. I think that was the, that was it. The, yeah. yeah, and then, yeah. So Chevy left after, you know, sometime in the second season and Billy came in. Yeah. Really as, re- as his replacement. But in that first crew, when you guys are just trying to figure out what the show is and working this stuff out, who was the most, like, you know, consistently surprising, like, like funny, like just where you're like, holy shit, that guy or that they woman. They were, they yeah. all were, and 
every it was so competitive. You it know. was they'll, from the beginning. Yes, and they'll admit it now. Everybody, yeah. there's only so much camera time. Sure. Everybody wanted to get on that show. Yeah. And Lauren sort of ran it almost like a T group therapy or something. You know, whatever happens out of the group. Uh-huh. He'll support it, you know, so relationships got formed almost like Survivor. What do they call it? <laughs> Alliance. People formed alliances. <laughs> yeah, right. All kinds right of Right from the beginning. Writers, you know, performers would have to form an alliance with a writer so that they had somebody to write that was, for them. That was going on right at the beginning. Yes, stay up all night, you know, writing something. Was Frank in there then? Yes, Franken was there right was the original, beginning. right? And, and, uh, Franken sometimes refers to a party that he had at his house before SNL went on the air to watch the Howard Cosell. His show was called Saturday Night Live. Uh huh. <laughs> and we got together at Frank's and I was there, you know, to yeah. at that historic party as we watched Howard Cosell. And he had a rep company too with, with Billy and Brian Murray and Chris Guest. That was his rep company. Yeah, come on. Yes. And no, his, he did not. yes, he had like the a rep company guesser? that would come back. Yeah, he had, he was going to be like the new Ed Sullivan. He oh, was doing his show out deal? of the Ed Sullivan Theater, same year, 75, same year as Saturday Night, and his show was called Saturday Night Live, and it was in primetime, and his rep company was called the Primetime Players, and that's why Lauren called his, they're not ready for Primetime Players. Howard Cosell. Yes. How long that's, did that last? Not very long. <laughs> Didn't last very long, and that's why, you know, then we got to call our show Saturday Night Live. So who was, who were the writers? Was Franken and Davis? Franken and Davis. And then, uh, what's his name? Uh, trying to think of the writers. Michael O'Donoghue, of course. Right. But the other guy, uh, Swybell. So Alan Swybell, yeah, who formed an alliance with Gilda and wrote uh-huh. a lot of her stuff at that. Marilyn Suzanne Miller. Yeah. Of the women. Uh, Rosie Schuster. Yep. And Beats. Yeah. Uh, those are uh, some of those original writers. O'Donoghue. Uh, da- da- Oh, Donahue. Was crazy, and Jim right? Downey came in a little bit later. Yeah, but Michael was a trip, huh? Well, he had his own thing, certainly, and he, <laughs> I mean, he was a sweetheart of a guy. Yeah. Uh, but of course his writing style was, was on the macabre side. Out there. For sure. Yeah, yeah but it found its place. We all got to know and love him and appre- <laughs> appreciate his humor. For sure. Uh, and it, and it was certainly, you know, uh, the dangerous part of SNL. A lot of that came from Michael O'Donoghue. Yeah. Died young too, huh? Too young. Yeah. So when did the band become its own thing? Like on, be- on SNL? Yeah. Uh, well, I mean, when does a band become its own thing? What do you, what do you mean? It, well, I mean, like, you know, it, like I, I'm trying to remember the first season and I remember you. But, you know, it's certainly that, that band, like, coming in and out of commercial and, and then, like, the different man, manifestations of it. But your band, you know, which was the band who went on to back the Blues Brothers on that record, right? With, uh, with... Well, no, we picked some people out of it. We poached Steve Jordan and the horn, some of the horn players from SNL Live. But then we got them from all other places. But who was in Legit the original? Legit guys. Uh, you, you weren't originally the music director. No, Howard was, and I was the piano player. Right. But you know what? I used to, unabashedly, I was such a big Elton John fan. I know, you wore those glasses. I wore those big white glasses. Yes. Yeah. Just as a tribute to him. Yeah. And I didn't care. It was his, his tra- trademark. Why do you wear it? Well, because I love him. Somehow it worked for me, too. If there was a shot of the band, you'd see those big white glasses. I thought you were in charge. I always thought you were in charge. I know. But, well, Howard was. He, Howard didn't feel comfortable being like Stan Kenton standing in front of a band conducting. Right. He always he wanted to get off stage. Yeah. One time he tried having a desk on stage. Yeah. You guys will be playing and I'll be kind of sitting at a desk. You know, anything that he wouldn't have right. to be an old-fashioned kind of band leader. Right. So, uh, you know, it kind of felt him. I became sort of a little bit more seen on this thing. And I think it was a gradual thing. Well, when, the, the, when we, when Lily Tomlin did show number six. Yeah. And sang St. James Infirmary. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and we all dressed up. Howard and his band dressed up as nurses. Mm-hmm. We had to wear nurses out. I remember that, yeah. Yeah, well, that may have been, you know, the first time the band got some serious <laughs> yeah. exposure. And I learned that pantyhose can ride up. <laughs> it's an important show business lesson. Yes. Well, Almost as important as the Miles advice. Exactly. Yeah, don't don't, don't wear, play the route. And, you <laughs> don't know, wear hose in a bit. Yeah. That's right. <laughs> so so you, how long were you... The, did you eventually become the musical director? No, I no, no. never was. Howard was for the whole five years that I was there, yeah. But I was a writer of special musical material. And then I started performing a little bit. Now, and, when, what's the story about you were, you, you had the fuck, you said the fuck? That's right. I was the first guy to say fuck on live on, TV. Uh, live TV. And I'm not proud of it, but it, it was a legitimate 
mistake. I did not do it on purpose like some mm-hmm. others have been accused of doing. Yeah. We were doing, I think this was the fifth season. Uh, did you ever hear the Trogs tape? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like one of those rich. underground right. Buddy Rich kind of tapes where yeah. you hear the Trogs in the studio trying to follow up their big hit wild thing, but they have no way to communicate musically. Right. They don't know how to, you know, how to get an arrangement together. So they kept saying, you know, you had the fucking bait, you we were playing the fucking, you had it before. Yeah. So we, we transcribed, Frank and Davis actually transcribed it. Yeah. Reframed it as a medieval band. Yeah. Uh, rehearsing. Mm-hmm. Uh, Belushi in a guest appearance, he had left the show but came back as a guest. And we were rehearsing as a medieval band, I was acting in it, but playing, but saying the lines of the trogs. Yeah. But since it was television, we instead of saying fuck, we were saying flog. Yeah. You flog, you had the flogging beat. Yeah. And I remember Frank and in between, so after the dress rehearsal yeah. came out to me and said, you're getting some good laughs with that flogging. Be, feel free to expand, add a few more if you want. Yeah. Well, that's all I needed to hear. Yeah. I was on my own, I was saying flogging this, flogging that, and then once I said the fucking beat and I just slipped. And I said, oh, my God. And then you, I've seen the tape. You see my head turn to the side. I'm going, oh, my God. What? Am, and then, oh, my God, where are we in the scene? I come back. You know, where are the cards? I didn't know what to. I thought, this is it for me. I've had Was it, it on a delay then or no? No. No, no it went so right it out there. played. It went out there. But you know what? We were doing English accents and bad ones at that. People didn't even, I think people didn't notice. Most did, people didn't did even Lauren? notice. Did Lauren? Lauren did, and he came over and he said, um, well, you just broke down the last barrier. <laughs> And he was very <laughs> sweet about it because he knew that it was a, a really a mistake. It yeah. was, and I right. wasn't just trying to cause right, a right. flare up and say fuck for the yeah, yeah. for the course. Of and, it. But that is, yes, my claim to fame. And what was your relationship with Lauren over the years? Good, always terrific. Yeah, I've got to say, I was Howard's piano player. You know, yeah. So Ca- came aboard under those, not even working directly for Lauren, but right, for so you're once removed. But right. he was always so generous. I mean, he'd be in the, you know, late at night. We're there all night because we none of us had girlfriends or anything yeah. else to do. Yeah. Know? And uh, Lauren would be in the, his office, like with Chevy and Paul Simon, Shelley Duvall. Yeah. Paul, come on in. We're just running a few. You know, what do you think about this? And I'm the piano player from Canada. Yeah. <laughs> what do you think about this? Is this funny? And this Lauren, you know, I don't know why, but he was so very equ- equanimous yeah. at that and time. And also, you're a fellow Canadian. Maybe that had something to do. And with you're it. probably a good laugher. He was very perhaps. He trusted your. Uh, he your liked to hear a good laugh, <laughs> and so he really did from the very beginning. He included me in the creative team, and I'll always be so grateful to that. I had a lot of wonderful. Experience. Is he in your phone? Lauren is not in my phone, but his email is in my phone. Oh, good. Okay. Yes, yes. I could email him right now. <laughs> Let's email him, see if he responds. So, all right. So you do, you do SNL for five years and like the blues, like, what was it, like Belushi, like, was he, like, uh, like, what kind of guy was he? Was he a nice guy? Yes, he was a very nice guy. Uh, with immense appetites. We, we, we've all, you know, everybody knows. <laughs> very, you have a diplomatic way of putting things. And well, it was just one of those things, you know. Uh, At that time, I guess, you know, there was a lot of it going around, and some people... You know, Nobody knew that anybody was going to die Yeah, from right. it, and then he died from it. Uh, I mean, But he had gone pretty far with it. Yeah, yeah. no, yeah. Never yeah, sleeping yeah. and yeah, stuff. Yeah, and yeah. so when we would all, you know, write that show and work on best and then go back to sleep, he'd, say, he'd go out. You know, yeah. that's when he would just come alive. Right. Uh, so he always operated at that level of energy. Full on, full yeah, on. Yeah, yeah. He kind of, like, there's something about that type, the way he did comedy... You know, it sort of made such an impression on so many generations of guys, a lot of heavy guys for some reason. Yeah. That's sort of like all in, all the time. And no matter what kind of shape he was in when he rolled in on yeah. Saturday, you could depend on him to kill. Yeah. He was a dependable performer. So a writer, you know, if uh-huh. it was a sketch, you knew he was going to deliver. Yeah, yeah. No matter what kind of shape he was in, hung over or whatever he was, you know, yeah. and he always did. Yeah. Always did. So how does the uh, the the shift to like w- w- how do you get the Letterman gig? Because it was in the I building. Left, yes, well, well, uh, sort of. I left the Saturday Night Live with everybody else, the whole original company, and Lauren. We everybody left after five years, and I didn't see, couldn't see sticking around any right. any longer. You know, right. and I was so young that I was thinking, you know, hey, I'm just getting started. What's next? And also, you're learning now how to play with uh, you know people. Performers that come in, right? Exactly. That's the first experience of that. Yes, and also doing a little studio work, which I really wanted to do, a studio piano player. And you did a lot of that? Getting a little of that and Barry being on Manilow. Saturday Night Live. Yeah, and be, being on Saturday Night Live, you know, gave me exposure in that yeah. area, too. Well, let's call that piano player. I heard him, you know, he can do. Who, were you, who did you play with? 
Uh, Everybody? Uh, yeah, a long time. I made a record with uh, John Mayall. Uh -huh. Oh, John Mayall. Yes. I, I talked to him. Uh huh. He's been in here. I don't know why his name came to mind, but all these different things. Uh, Joan Armitrading, the great uh, British uh, yeah. artist, I made a record with her. Uh, I can't even remember a lot of that. I, <laughs> I did a Yoko Ono. I did some sessions for her. You did? How was yes, that? Yes, yeah. She was remarkably together in the studio. Did that, did that improvisational stuff come in handy for her? Uh, <laughs> well, of course she had to be on her level. Yeah. But some of the things, I mean, I think I played on a record called, uh, Walking on Thin Ice. Okay. One of her, you know, well-known records. Did you meet John? Uh, never got to meet John. Oh. I met the other three Beatles and never sure. got to meet. I got close to John when he was, there was a period of time when he couldn't get into the U.S. because of prior right. drug conviction. I mean, he was doing Nixon a lot of stuff. Shut him in, out. Yes, and he was doing a lot of stuff in Toronto and Can Montreal for that, for that reason. Yeah. And I went to a press conference once when he was announcing, uh, you were going to have a big peace festival. Uh -huh. You know, and that was like as close as I ever got to John Lennon, but just it, it was momentous. I, well, I remember in that first five years of SNL, there was this constant, like, this idea that Lauren was going to bring the Beatles back together, right? Well, of course, he had that funny sketch yeah. where he was offering them uh, $3,000, right. you know, for yeah. the four of them. And he would say, I don't know how you want to split it up. You want to give Ringo less, yeah. whatever you guys want, but yeah. here is the check. Yeah. And he would, that was a running bit, very funny. And then yeah. we've all heard the story about how the Lennon and McCartney, who weren't on such great terms, but somehow they were visiting, they were together that night, yeah. and they saw it and they said, we should go down. We should go right down. It's only a couple bucks away. And then they both realized they were too tired. Oh, <laughs> didn't George Harrison showed up, right? Sure. Harrison did it one, one of the shows that I missed. I was out here doing it something. And I remember watching it. Yes. Harrison and Paul Simon sang. Right. A duet, yeah. Here Comes the Sun. Yeah. yeah but I think yeah. that was pre-taped. I was, I was so excited about I was always so excited to watch that now because I was a kid. You know, I was just, you know, kind of 13 or 14. So, like, staying up for it, my parents letting me stay up for it, it felt like really kind of racy stuff. I think know? it's the same today. I think they're still having that effect, and kids still want to say Well, now it's become very relevant it. and very, you know, they've really got their teeth sunk in. They sure do. Yeah. It's, it, it's incredible. It's better than it's been in a long yes. time. Yes, it is. They've got a great cast going. So, all right, so Letterman, what, you run into him in the yeah, hall? Yeah, so, no, uh, 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 two years went by, and I'm doing studio work, and, and I just got a call from his manager's office. Can you... He's getting a show. It's going to come on after Johnny Carson. Come in and meet him. And I went in and just had a cold meeting, just like this. And we kind of hit it off. And he said, um, I used to see you on Saturday Night Live. He mentioned the Bill Murray things when Billy would yeah. do the lounge singer. Yeah, he loves Bill Murray, right? And, yes, he loves Bill yeah. and still does. And he remembered that Bill Murray lounge singer stuff yeah. when he was Nick Winters right, and Nick right. Springs. And I would always be in the scene playing the piano. Yeah. And I would help put those together, too, yeah. with a number of other writers. And he mentioned that. And he just, he claims to this day that he never had anybody else in mind. He wanted me for the job. Yeah. Uh, anyway, we hit it off. He said, what kind of band would you put together? I said, well, you know, I can only have four pieces. That was kind of the rule. I'd love to have an R&B band playing the great R&B classics instrumental. Yeah. He said, well, I've always thought of myself as the Wayne Cochran of comedy anyway. And <laughs> I said, what? What an obscure reference. <laughs> what is who's that? Wayne Cochran was a regional guy in Miami, had one hit going back to Miami, and he was known as the White James Brown because he yeah. did a James Brown kind of act. Sang that way, oh, wait, and he had the... totally white hair, teased up into a huge pompadour. Jocko fun. played with him, exactly. Yeah, exactly. And I saw that. Yeah, I saw it in Toronto. Wayne Cochran with Jocko Pastorius on bass. Yeah, never. I never got it. It was the strongest thing I ever saw. I bet. Incredible. So that incredible. was. And I think they took Jocko to the hospital after that. I remember. Oh really? He, you know, he knocked himself out on that on that bass guitar. Yeah, okay. and then he, he <laughs> felt, collapsed yeah. from exhaustion. No kidding. That's how heavy they were. Well, that's and how he had he's... like ten horns. Yeah. who came through the audience at the beginning. Yeah. I mean, it was so exciting. He could barely, he didn't have a great vocal instrument, but he had a lot of soul. Yeah. So you only wanted four? You know what? And I, I've read this. I, I think it's probably true. There were certain laws laid down by Johnny Carson, who, of course, controlled that time slot that was going to follow him. Yeah. And he said, now, I don't want, you know, you can't be doing the same show. You can't have the same guests that I have. You can't do a monologue like I do. That's why Dave used to only do about three jokes at the yeah. top. And then, right. Yeah, and that was the re And you can't have a big band like I have. You can have, you can have four. Right. Well, this is perfect for me because I came up, you know, in Canada playing in these little rock bands. I know how to do four. Yeah. Great. So, you know, let me at it. So you had Jordan and, and Hiram. Hiram. Yes, and, and Will. Will. Yeah, and me. That was it, the four of us. And we could really turn on a dime. We could play anything. We knew all the styles. 
you know, we could play for anybody. Yeah. It was a terrific, yeah, uh, little, little unit that we had. And I hired guys who knew all the, cause even though these guys were like jazz players and very accomplished studio, they still loved the same rock and roll as I loved. They just didn't necessarily admit it, you know. Right, sure. And then I got them playing Satisfaction and we're going to do Good Lovin' and stuff. Yeah. And everybody started to, well, it's kind of funny. You play these records right. Yeah. And there really is something to them. Yeah. So we weren't just playing Satisfaction. You know, we were really seeing what is great about it. Uh-huh. Well, the way the bass moves against the guitar is so cool. It makes a difference. So you made coordinate. it challenging and exciting. And we just tried to do it right for the first time. People noticed, you know, yeah. that it sounded kind of like the record. We'd, we'd play these intros and it sounded like the record. And then before the vocalist was supposed to come in and there was no vocal, we'd just play it like right. We'd already be in commercial. So right. people would be saying, wow, what am I missing? What am I missing? Well, you know, Did you're you not keep missing playing? All that yeah, we played all the way through. Yeah. We may, I got that from Saturday Night Live. You know, we were. You go on break. Live. And you, and you yeah, got to entertain. And there's a live band. Yeah. And they said to me at the beginning of Letterman, you know, and of course you'll record the theme and we'll play the recording every night. And I said, wait a minute. Well, I'm not going to record the, it's live. We're trying to make it like it's live, even though we're going to tape it in the afternoon. We got to play live. Yeah. So I, you know, I won that battle at least, and yeah. we played the theme live every night. Well, it was like it was always great to see you guys on on the Letterman show, the first one, and then even, and then you know the second one too. But like, because you're always nailing the songs perfect. And then, like, the rapport starts, you know, you, you somehow develop this strange rapport with Dave that, that remained pretty consistent through all, however many years you were with him. Yeah. That, you know, like, I don't know if, like, like sometimes you, you, you seem like you might not have heard what he said. Yeah. <laughs> well, and sometimes I didn't. I'm a little deaf, you know, yeah. uh, after all these years of rock and roll. <laughs> but also, it would take me a little time. I mean, I'm not a comic, you know. So sometimes, but that was the funniest thing sometimes about Sometimes it would take me a minute to think of what to say, but then I'd come back and say it, you know. Okay. Wait, bring the camera back. I thought of something. Yeah. Come back, come it, back. That became the funny part about you two, is that, like, your, your, your weird stilted timing, because you were right at the end. Well, thank you for complimenting my weird... Still the timing, but whatever it was. But then, but then sometimes you just nail it, and yeah. you like, and it almost sometimes you know, Dave. It was just a funny rapport. It's every night, you know, yeah, it was different sure. every night. But he was so generous, really, and would say to me, and how many bosses would say, "If you have anything, jump in any time." Yeah. And he actually said that to me. Really, jump in any time. I don't care if I'm with a guest or anything. <laughs> From the very beginning. Yes, and that was such encouragement and <laughs> confidence building for me. <laughs> uh, not from the very beginning. Very beginning, they did say, well, can you, are you the kind of guy that could, Dave could play off? Can you play with? I say, absolutely, yes. But uh, they never really gave me the, uh, the opportunity. I had to grab it myself. Right. right. You know, I just grabbed the mic and one day I started talking. You know what? The mic wasn't even turned on. <laughs> Oh my God! Well, they don't even know you're going to talk. Well, you know, then I had to make sure my mic is on when I talk. I might say, "Oh, I don't think they want it on." Yeah, yeah, what? Yeah. You know, I had to get that. No, we want it on. Oh, okay, so then they were going to turn it on. Then I got. To, I introduced the band one night, and Dave cracked up. You know, and he said, "Do do more of that. Do more of that." He was very, very encouraging. And you guys like had a good rapport. You'd go out to dinner sometimes. Yes, so? yes, oh, yeah. and we still do. We yeah. still see each other. We commiserate a little bit. Oh, that's great. You know what it's like to be two uh, later in life gentlemen. Oh, good. And uh, how old are your kids though? He's got a young kid. Mine are pretty young too. I didn't get married till I was forty. Uh huh. My daughter's twenty four. My oh. son eighteen. Okay. So, so you're still in it. Still in it, yeah. yeah. Son's still at home. Daughter yeah. on her own, but son, you know, a senior in high school. Sure. Going through, you know, where's he going to go to college? That's what we're living through now, that pressure. Oh, yeah. Well, yeah, it'll, it'll yeah. work out. Did he do all right? I th- oh, yeah. He's, he's got a, some he's, choices? He's terrific. Yeah. Okay. Well, I mean, terrific student. Oh, good. So, one of the things I wondered is, what? how do you decide when somebody needs your support, you know, when they perform on the show we, we, with Letterman? Because, like, sometimes you guys play, sometimes they bring their own operation. You know, like, how is that? What What is that discussion? First of all, we're talking about a show that hasn't been on the air in two years. Let's just remember that. We're talking almost like it's a, we're going to do a show tonight. It's a no, no, but you history. Know. Yeah, well, what happened? When we were in, at, at NBC, we had a very small studio, and right. we were... I know that studio. The acts would be encouraged to play with my band. Just out of space. For yeah, space, space, and also we would have then something to offer the audience, something different that you didn't see on MTV all the time, you know? Right. Them in another environment, playing with new musicians and stuff. And it was very interesting. Right. Uh, when we moved to CBS, partly, you know, the stage was bigger, and things got a little more competitive. And, of course, it's the easiest thing, if Katy Perry's going to do the show, easiest if she just brings her whole 
whole band and whatever else and she's got to worry about and everything. And she doesn't have to worry about it. Right. So it got a little bit more uh, people bringing their own self-contained sure. stuff. And then every once in a while, somebody says, oh, I want, you know, I'd like to, Paul to play along or, you know, oh, something yeah. from the band. And it, it would be up to the artist. Oh, really? Yeah. Yeah. Because, like, I know when you jump in, it's it's always, uh, you know, it's great. You you love doing it. Of course I love doing I'm it. I'm sorry. I, I don't mean to talk about it like it's the present. No, Maybe no, it. I love that. I mean, but uh, for a minute, I thought, gee, I'm late. i got to get in. <laughs> But you thirty three years it doesn't just go away. It's it's very you know, it stays with you that sure. Experience. But you got opportunities to play with all these amazing guys. I remember Zoe took me to Dylan Sound. Zoe Friedman. Yeah. Zoe Friedman was our, our talent book, yeah, especially for comics. Yeah, she gave me my first letterman. Oh, I love it. Great. And uh I remember she told me to, like, she knew I was a Dylan fan. She said, he, he can come over and watch the sound check. And it was just so funny, because I don't remember what he played. Do you? Uh, First time he was on when he had those guys uh, uh from a... Uh, uh, yeah, with the, yeah, what's his Cruzados name? Cruzados or something playing with them. He had never met them before. The, not the, was that Sexton or wasn't? Was the Cruzados? Yeah, or? yeah. Three guys that I don't think he ever played with again. He just brought them on. I don't know where even where they got. And and in the soundcheck, he played a million different songs, none of which he played on the air. Yeah. One of them was Treat Her Right by Roy Head, one of my right. favorite oldies. Yeah, and yeah, Dylan, yeah. Dylan doing that. Yeah. Imagine. And he just, like, played with you guys? He just, uh, he was playing with his own band and just trying them out on things. Well, I just remember he was, like, when I was there, he I saw him, like, just walk around and he, he started talking to, who I, what's her name, the guitar player? Felicia. Yeah, Felicia. You know, like, you know, I got one of those. Uh, how do you like that? Like, it was very funny uh-huh. just to see him become human. Yes, <laughs> yes, yeah. So I did get to play with him, uh, you know, uh, later at CBS. I think he did, uh, uh, da, 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 da. Forever Young. That was the one I saw. Yeah. Okay, so yes. Yeah. I think he just asked me to play the organ. Mm-hmm. He didn't have a keyboard at that Right. Time, so I played organ along with him. You, 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 thrill. It was ex- oh, exciting, thrill, right? Yeah. Thrill. Who else you like, were, were some of your memories where you're like, holy shit, I'm playing with this guy? Well, uh, James Brown, I, you know, it's, that's my go-to. I always mention it because yeah. I never got over it. Yeah. He made us play so well. Oh, really? We never thought we could. That, that's a band leader, huh? Yeah, I mean, when he starts shaking that ass, I mean, you just can't... And his his voice becomes another instrument, uh-huh. another part of the groove, and it just makes everybody sound good. You know? Oh, yeah. We were skying. I remember Steve Jordan and I, uh, we both got our first, first VCRs uh-huh. at the time. That's uh-huh. when it was, like 82, you know, yeah, VCRs. Yeah. And we taped that Letterman show. We used to watch it every night religiously yeah. and memorize not only the musical stuff, but the dialogue. We had all the dialogue when he interviewed by Dave. And it's, at the very end, he did a third song spontaneously. He right. Said, he said, you know what I'd like to do right now? Before you close, can we close with, I got, I got the feeling. And then you hear Jordan's voice. Whoa! You hear him from over <laughs> in the car. Dave says, yeah, we'll take a commercial. We'll come back. And, and James commandeered the show. Yeah. And Dave loved it. <laughs> never, yeah. never forget it. That's fucking beautiful. And what now? We I, we sort of skipped over that Blues Brothers thing. Now, like it seemed to me, like during, when when the Blues Brothers band, like I remember, I knew all their names because he introduced Blue Lou Marini. What yeah. happened to that guy? Oh, still around. Plays with James Taylor regularly. And uh, what's his, who's your who's your trombone guy? Tom Bones Malone. He, Bones Malone. He played with me on Letterman all these years. Yep, yep. And uh, he's with me uh, on actually the new today. Band. Yeah, and he on the new record. Yep. He's going to do a Kimmel show. We're doing Jimmy Kimmel tomorrow. That's exciting. Uh, yeah, Tom came out to do it. Yeah. Who else is with you from ever, forever well, on this the record? Uh, on the record, well, I mean, Will Lee, you yeah, know, Felicia, who you yeah. mentioned, the whole band, Sid McGinnis. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and Aaron Hike and, uh, and, uh, Frank Green are my two more recent horn players. Who was the guitar player before Felicia? What was that guy's name? Sid McGinnis, and he's, yeah, he's still on- with her. Yeah, I had two guitars with Felicia and Right, him. right, yeah. And he's on it too, yes. He can really play all, all yes, the different things. All different stuff, play steel guitar too. Could play with the country acts, you know. But when he did the Blues Brothers, it really seemed to me that Belushi was pretty earnest about it. Yes. He liked playing. He liked singing. He loved singing, and he loved... I mean, everybody wanted to be a rock and roll star. Sure. You know, not just yeah. Belushi, but he had an opportunity to do it, and there was a real tour yeah. with a real plane, and, you know, yes, we were a real band for a while there, even though we put it together as really a sort of a good-natured tribute to the music that right. we loved. He wanted to but do it. it. But, but, yes, he, he sold some it. tickets. Yes, we sure. were. We did quite nicely. Didn't Chevy play keyboards? Not with the Blues Brothers. No, but, I don't no, know. But Chevy in, is a pianist, yes, and and a jazz pianist influenced by Bill Evans. And one of Chevy's musical claims famous, he had a band in college with uh, Donald Fagan. Oh, right, right. And he played drums. Yeah. He played rock drums in that. You love Steely Dan? Of course I love, love Steely Dan. How can, how can you not? Well, I'm trying to come around. 
to them. Yeah. Well, you've got to see. Did you see that show? Um, uh, uh, that uh, Mulaney and, uh, and Nick Crow. Yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, yeah. hello. That's all about Steely Dan for some reason. <laughs> I didn't. I wasn't sure why. It really was. You yeah, saw it. They, so- I saw it on Broadway. They talk a lot about uh, Steely. How these are these two older Upper West Side gentlemen. They, yeah. They happen to love Steely Dan. They have an argument about it during the show. Oh, I don't remember that. I've been on that show. Uh-huh. I don't know what the Broadway version ended well, up. Well, the same one thing about the Broadway. They have a guest. You know, doing that tuna, too much tuna bit every right. night. Exactly. So I, so I did that. Oh, I, yeah. I got on stage. And, and you riffed it out with him? You riffed out the I, tuna thing? Uh, yes, but, uh, but I, I had one joke I didn't tell. Uh, I'm always sorry. I meant to tell it. Two old Jewish jazz musicians on the Upper West Side, and they're sitting on a park bench. First guy says to the other, Oi. Second guy says, I'm hip. <laughs> so that, you know, <laughs> I'll pretend that I you, told that. You should, you should have them integrate that into the yeah, show. Bring it back, yeah. I like those guys. They're very funny. Yes. So how did you get involved with the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame? That's a regular gig for you now, right? It has been. This is the first year, though, that it's all, uh, aside from Joe I like Baez, how you, you, you wipe your, 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 your face and head with a Kleenex like a musician. Like, yeah, you're, like you're, Louis Armstrong. Yeah, yeah like, like you're, Louis yeah. Armstrong. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah it's like, anyway, well, it's kind of a little warm in here. Well, I'm we sorry. can't have the air on because it would Annoyed. interfere with the sound, of course. I'm familiar with that. Don't yeah. worry about it. What were we talking about? Uh, the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. Oh, yeah, yeah. You know, um, so as a studio musician, uh, one time I got a call, come in, uh, in an afternoon, it's Robert Plant. Mm. And it turned out to be that project, The Honey Drippers. Oh, that's good. Uh, with Robert doing old rock and roll. You did that first record? Yes. Mm-hmm. And I played on, uh, you know, uh, Good Rockin' at Midnight and also that first one, uh, Nice, uh, nice fella. I can't remember the name of it. At first, it was kind of a ballad. Yeah. Um, terrific guy. And to hear his voice in your headphones is a hell of an experience. I bet. But Ahmet was producing it, co-producing it with him. Ahmet, Ahmet Ertigan. Ertigan, yes. Yeah. And that's when I met Ahmet. And Ahmet likes, you know, what I did. He could say I was familiar with those old styles. Mm-hmm. And Ahmet hired me for the very first uh, Rock and Roll Hall of Fame induction dinner when they said, they were saying, you know, well, we can't ask the people to play. They're here to be honored, you know. Let's, what we'll do is we'll take a picture. At the end of the night, we'll get everybody on stage for a picture, and then we'll just happen to have amplifiers there and see if anybody picks up guitars. That's well, of course they did, and yeah. they were all, but it was totally spontaneous jam session. Yeah. And that's, you know, I was able to kind of lead that. Uh, one advantage I had was that a lot of the players had done Letterman individually. Sure. Sitting in with me on an individual basis, and so they knew my signals. They got used to my signals, you know, and so if I held up, Four fingers in the middle of this big rock and roll Hall of Fame chance, everybody would know. Go to the four chord, you know. Yeah. Go to we're in C, go to F. <laughs> yeah, yeah, those kind of things. Right. You know? uh, it worked out, and they kept calling. I never took the gig for granted. I, every year, I wonder if they're going to call me. This year, everybody's self-contained. They got yes, they got Journey, you know, and stuff like that. Steve is going to so, play with Journey. Uh, I'm not saying that. No. I'm not sure what's going on with that. Uh-huh. So there's always some last year. I was like, where's Richie? Yes, there's always some negotiation. It's wild, right? Somebody, well, these things go run deep, you know, when yeah. these bands break up. And strangely enough, it's often about money. It really, How they're yeah. going to split up the money, you know. Right. But whatever it is, they can't forgive each other. And every, year after year, there was somebody who didn't want to play. And, oh, can't you just put bygones aside and be honored with the rest of it? You know, no, these things are serious. I know. You know they can't get over them. So, like, but what is your job in that when, they, when they're self-contained? Do you still have to? No, no, I don't have to do I don't you have, have to, to do They got their own guys. And, yeah. 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 Yeah, but you're still there. Yeah. Yeah, well, they, yeah, I'm still there. I mean, for the I like, big, the big thing at the end. There's always, so, you know, now it, it's more of a television show, and the numbers are rehearsed and stuff. And there isn't always a big thing at the end. It's always, it's got to be true. a little more That's polished true. so they can yeah. show it on TV. Right, right, right. It's funny, like those big things at the end. I think Scorsese sort of established that with the last waltz that. That that's I, the way that goes. I suppose so. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Well, that was certainly the definitive rock concert. Sure. Rock and concert and Ronnie group. Wood seems to show up at everything. He loves <laughs> he loves to play and is a very happy go lucky guy. You like his playing? I do. I like it. Well, he's a talented guy and he can play anything. That tone, right from Did the faces. Did a wonderful thing with him once in the eighties with Fats and Friends. It was on Cinemax at yeah. the time. Fats, Fats Domino? Domino, Ray Charles, and Jerry Lee Lewis. Oh, wow. And, you know, me with the house band with Ronnie Wood in the band. Yeah, yeah. And each of them does their set, each of the three great panel. And then they do a big thing at the end, you know, where we all try to play Jambalaya together. And oh, stuff. and so they, like, the Canadian rockers did all right. A few of them, Bachman Turner Overdrive and those guys. Did you know those guys? I do, uh, yes. Not at the time, but uh, when I was a kid, the Guess Who 
you know, with Randy Bachman was in it. Uh, well, American woman! Coming. Yes, uh, during those times, they, those guys were from Winnipeg, Manitoba. That was 500 miles Ooh. away from the Thunder Bay from where I was from. So at Christmas time, they were always playing our town to get enough money to buy Christmas presents so they could go home for Christmas. Yeah. So I saw them extensively, the Guess Who. Oh, yeah. And I've, I've gotten to know Bachman a little bit uh, more recently. Yeah. We did some sort of a thing with him, a DVD thing. Oh, yeah. BTO reunion and stuff. I got to play that yeah. piano on taking care of business. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Terrific. Mm. And a lot of rockers, yeah, but you know what? Uh, MTV, w- when that started up, we saw a lot of Canadians, Brian Adams. Rush. and Yeah, exactly. Rush and uh, Triumph. Yeah. Triumph. Yes, yeah. and uh, uh, these people had wor- world uh, influence. Yeah. Uh, when I was a kid, it was like Gordon Lightfoot. That was it. Gordon you know? Lightfoot. So, yeah. I tell you, man, that uh, that you know, it's with some of these guys that you realize, some especially the folk guys. Like if they knock out you know, one or two, like we, like you know, like John Prine has a lot of songs, but like Gordon Lightfoot, like if you could read my mind, yeah, what a fucking song, beautiful. It's all yeah. you need. Right? right, absolutely, and he's got a couple of them. He does have a couple of them. Sundown was, yeah. was another yeah. good one. Yep, yeah. yep. Yeah. The wreck of the Edmund Fitzgerald, I think, was you know a great story. But Americans know. do love that. I think Americans may like it a bit more than Canadians. Oh yeah. But if that, you know, if you if you had had Triumph and all that stuff, people coming out and uh, what was it uh, working for the weekend? Uh, yeah, yeah. Everybody's what, yeah, I can't remember what that band. Lover Boy, Lover Boy, yeah. <laughs> I might not have had to have. I can't believe I, I might not that. have met. Yes, you pulled that one. I might not have had to leave Canada, you know. <laughs> but at the, at the time, you just there wasn't much of a music scene in Canada at the time when I had I get, to come yeah, to U.S. I get a little flack for busting on Rush a little bit, and I, you know, I, I want to try to set the record straight because I've heard, because of my past comments of not liking Rush, that, that Getty Lee's a very nice guy, mm-hmm. and Leaf, and they're all good guys, and they're, you know, they, they're brilliant musicians. <laughs> Do you know them? I don't really know them. I have met them, yeah. and I, you know, when they were inducted in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, it was a time when we did the show from here in Los Angeles. And their audience was full of Rush fans. Their <laughs> fans are devoted. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I must say, I got them that night. What they're, a, they're yeah, good. Yeah. What, so, Yes is going to be in this year. Yes is one of the groups. Yes, I can't remember. Tupac. Uh-huh. Uh huh. Joan Baez. Oh yeah, I did, she just released a record or re- reissued uh-huh. a few records. She's amazing. She has a beautiful voice. So, Paul, are you going to tour with this outfit? Yes, this spring I am. Wow. Even in this day and age, it seems to be important to be able to go out and have an act and be able to entertain. I'm looking forward to doing it. Uh, April 1st is, a, you know, April 1st through July 1st. So we're going to be out there doing shows all over the place. And the, and the album's just called the, the, yes, wo- the, world, the album is The Artist, Paul Schaefer and the, the World's, World's Most Dangerous, Dangerous Band. Band. On yeah. Sire Records. Sire Records, exactly. Are you kidding? I'm the, I'm the female, I'm the white Madonna. Well, thanks for talking to me, buddy. A pleasure, Mark. A lot of fun. Paul Schaefer, ladies and gentlemen. I love that guy. I love talking to him. I, I liked having, I liked sitting across from him and looking at him. I like, I like Paul Schaefer. Thanks to Cabbage for sponsoring today's episode. Cabbage created a simple way for businesses to get flexible access to up to $100,000. Visit cabbage.com slash WTF and you'll get a $100 Visa gift card when you qualify. That's K-A-B-B-A-G-E dot com slash WTF. Go to WTFpod.com. Slash tour for my upcoming tour dates. I've got uh, dates in Austin, Denver, Boulder, Portland, D.C., Philly, Madison, Milwaukee, uh, and Minneapolis coming up. So those uh, pique your interest. Go to WTFPod.com slash tour. And, uh, and uh, you know, do what you got to do. Can't play any guitar today. Just can't do it. It's too early. And, uh, I got, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm harried. I'm sorry. I know it's going to break a lot of hearts. Boomer lives! You know, an address it, and here, here's the rundown. Anyways, they, all right, I'll get to it in a second. I, I want to, uh, I want to, you know, let you know, you can mark this down on your calendars. If you're in or around New York City on June 3rd, 
I will be at this year's book con along with my producer, Brendan McDonald, where we will have the first public unveiling of our new book, Waiting for the Punch, Words to Live By, from the WTF podcast. Go to thebookcon.com for tickets. You can get a day pass for Saturday, June 3rd, if you want to see us. Jeffrey Tambor also has a panel on Saturday, so you'll get some bang for your buck. It should be fun. Very excited about the book. Uh, yeah. Oh, also today on the show, Paul Schaefer. Paul Schaefer has been sort of, uh, making the rounds a bit because he's got an album out called Paul Schaefer and the World's Most Dangerous Band. But I'll tell you, man, if you're my age, even if you're not, but probably more so if you are 53, that is in and around that area, the, the figure or the, the person that is Paul Schaefer on television is, uh, somebody you've watched for decades. Uh, it's just, it, and he's always been this sort of secondary character. Obviously, the music's important, but him as a personality has you know, somewhat evolved, but maybe just gotten older. But if you were a, a kid like me, you know, in my first or probably my second year of college, I don't know when that show started, but I remember watching it religiously uh, every night on a on this clunky small color television set, thirteen inch or whatever. On my bed, I would move it onto my bed so I could watch Letterman at night. That's the kind of social life I had. And I was a religious uh, viewer of Letterman there at the beginning because it was so fucking great. I just, the the place that guy has in my mind, in my life, in my heart is is powerful. You know, David Letterman. But, uh, but watching Paul Schaefer at the beginning and evolve into this strange sideman, sidekick, you know, with him with his... On, even earlier, back on SNL, when I was a, wow, I just, yeah, I mean, when I was in high school, junior high, 77, just seeing him around in those bits with those big glasses, the big Elton John glasses, and then seeing him on Letterman and developing this rapport with David that was sort of weird and stony and just a little off. I don't know if it was, I don't know if it was a weed related. I just think it's Paul. And then just, you know, seeing him everywhere, the Blues Brothers movie, and then just seeing Paul Schaefer around. He's been this guy in the corner of the screen for decades, and, he, you know, he becomes more of a person as time goes on, and you watch him get older, and you watch him that when later, the, the, the last David Letterman show over those years. But he's just been with me seemingly since I was 13, so that's like 40 years Paul has been in the corner of the screen. I was happy to have him here because he's an amazing musician. He's been involved in a lot of stuff. And he's known a lot of people. And uh, so it was exciting for me to talk to Paul. I, I remember that I was going to tell you why yeah, why, why I'm doing this today. I, I, I'm not, I didn't forget that. By the way, Austin, Texas, next week, Paramount Theater, March 31st, uh, Austin, Texas. And I'll be in Boulder on April 7th uh, at the Boulder Theater in Denver at the Paramount Theater on April 8th. And... Hey folks, today's episode is brought to you by the Comedy Jam on Comedy Central. Based on the popular live show, comedians take the stage to tell a funny story about a song that means something to them. Then they live out their rock star fantasies by performing the song with a live band. Special guests include Jay Farrow, Mark Duplass, and Jesse Tyler Ferguson. Don't miss the Comedy Jam, Wednesdays at 10, 9 Central on Comedy Central or anytime on the CC app. We're also sponsored today by Cabbage. What? That can't be right. No, wait, it is. Cabbage with a K. If you need flexible small business financing, Cabbage has the answer. They've created a way for you to get approved right away, online or from your phone, for up to $100,000. Visit Cabbage.com slash WTF. When you qualify, you'll get a $100 Visa gift card. That's Cabbage with a K. K-A-B-B-A-G-E dot com slash WTF. Okay, let's do the show. The <laughs> All right, let's do this. How are you, what the fuckers? What the fuck buddies? What the fucking ears? What the fuck adelics? What the fuck nicks? What's happening? I'm Mark Marin. This is my podcast. Welcome. Thanks for hanging out. I know uh, a lot of you have been hanging out for a lot of years. Some of you are new because I can tell. By the numbers. Glad that people are finding some, uh, relief or whatever. Someone just told me that, uh, that my, uh, my podcast has become essential 
for them uh, to fall asleep. I don't know. I don't always know how to take that. I, there's there's a couple ways to take that. Either uh, <laughs> it just puts me right to sleep. Right as soon as you start talking, whoo, my eyes glaze over. Or there's something comforting about the persistent, uh, aggravated uh, uh, intensity that happens out of my face into your head that you find comforting. And if that's the case, I'm sorry. I, I it can't be easy for you the rest of the day. I am recording this a few days early for a couple of reasons. Uh, one being sometimes I don't like to take all the equipment on the road. What is that? Who's calling me? What's happening? I'm literally calling myself on FaceTime. Like, it, like I, I, I don't know, I was on my, uh, my own contact information on my iPhone. I must have hit a button and now I'm getting a FaceTime call from me and I'm looking at myself talking right now on my phone and I, I don't think I should answer it. I don't want to leave a message for me. That was weird. Why did that happen? I can't trust anything anymore when it comes to technology, but that, but that is the case. The reason that I'm doing this a few days early is twofold. So I'm not, I'm not going to be up to speed, uh, on, you know, anything that's really happened over the weekend, uh, because, uh, maybe that's what the phone call is. Maybe I'm calling myself to tell me what's going to happen. Maybe that's me calling from the future just to give me a heads up. It, it knew that I was recording and it's maybe it's a message going like, I don't even bother. A lot of shit goes down over the weekend. It's going to sound weird on Monday. When you, yeah, so you know that's happening. We're sponsored today by Stamps.com, one of the sponsors our listeners use the most. Why? Because they save people time and money. What better reasons are there? Mail any letter, any package using just a computer and printer, and the mail carrier picks it up. Avoid the hassle of the post office and mail everything from postcards to envelopes to packages, domestic or international. Create your Stamps account in minutes online with no equipment to lease and no long-term commitments. Just click print, mail, and you're done. And unlike the post office, Stamps.com never closes. Use it at your convenience any time of the day. They'll send you a digital scale to automatically calculate the exact uh, postage you need, and it only costs fifteen ninety nine per month with no hidden charges or contracts. And right now, you can enjoy the Stamps.com service with a special offer that includes a four-week trial plus postage and a digital scale without long-term commitments. Go to Stamps.com, click on the microphone at the top of the homepage, and type in my code WTF. That's Stamps.com. Enter WTF. Stamps.com. Never go to the post office again. Pow! I just shipped my pants. Just coffee.coop. Classic plug. So the reason, the reason I'm recording this today, and uh, this has happened before, maybe it's happened to some of you. It's not a good thing. Uh, it's, 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 it's really probably, you know, outside of, uh, illness or heart attack or, or, you know, uh, maybe looking at the news and finding out the entire world's on fire is, uh, it's sort of a bad moment when, you know, when you, you don't realize anymore, you, maybe you've done it once before, but you just start getting sloppy 